I'm Laurie Cardoza-Moore, and this is Focus on Israel. Many of us baseball fans have heard the story of persecution and racist attacks against Jackie Robinson, the first black major league baseball player. But did you know about the many similar incidents against the first Jewish players as well? On our show today, you'll learn about anti-Semitism in the big leagues and how Jewish players overcame abuse and ridicule and became some of baseball's greatest. Hello, I'm Lori Cardoza-Moore, founder of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating and sharing the message of Christian biblical responsibility to the people and land of Israel in the face of a growing global genocidal anti-Semitism. Proclaiming Justice to the Nations was birthed to stop the silence, to wake up Christians and people of conscience to the realities of a world bent on destroying Israel and the Jewish people. Since 2005, PJTN has a proven track record of fighting for the rights of Israel and the Jewish people, a record of standing firm in the face of overwhelming odds against a world of Israel and Jew hatred a record of not compromising on the very plan of God. PJTN's strategy involves a campaign of biblical truth. The more Christians who see our materials and our media content, the more that will stand with the Jewish people and Israel. Our program usually deals with very controversial subjects, and you wouldn't think baseball would fit into that category. Unfortunately, the early years of America's sport was not all roses for minorities, such as blacks and Jews, among others. As with most of America, though, the institutionalized world of segregation slowly gave way as many Christians and people of conscience stepped forward and stood against racism of all kinds. But it was a long road and not one easily traveled. It took brave men of fortitude, such as Jackie Robinson, Hank Greenberg, and Al Rosen to break the color and ethnic barriers and endure the verbal and sometimes physical attacks. Baseball would not have been the same though. As of 2010, there have been 166 Jewish major league players. On our program today, we're featuring part of a remarkable new documentary in fact, the first major documentary to tell their stories. It's titled, Jews and Baseball, An American Love Story. This film explores the connection between Jewish Americans and baseball, our nation's most iconic institution. More than a film about sports, it is a story of immigration, assimilation, bigotry, heroism, the passing on of traditions, and the shattering of stereotypes. The stereotype of Jews as non-athletic, as well as anti-Semitism, are two issues that many Jewish baseball players faced and had to overcome. Despite such obstacles, there have been standout Jewish players in every decade from the 1860s to the present. The film focuses especially on two players. One is Hank Greenberg, a two-time American League MVP, five-time All-Star, and Hall of Famer. Anti-Semitic barbs directed at him from the stands served to motivate him, he said. He sat out Yom Kippur during a tight pennant race on the advice of his mother. The other is Sandy Koufax, Hall of Fame pitcher, three-time Cy Young Award winner, and seven-time All-Star, who sat out game one of the 1965 World Series game to go to synagogue to observe Yom Kippur. Interviews in Jews and baseball include fans, writers, executives, and especially players, including Al Rosen, Kevin Euchelius, Sean Green, Norm Sherry, Ron Bloomberg, Bob Feller, and Yogi Berra. Fans Ron Howard and Larry King speak of the meaning of Jewish ballplayers in their own lives. 
while historians and even two baseball-loving rabbis relate the stories of Jewish players to the turbulent history of the last century. These powerful, personal, and historical stories are interwoven with an extraordinary collection of rare archival footage and photos. It's an engaging story of great drama, unforgettable games, and the broad sweep of American history. But it's also about bigotry, discrimination, and overcoming anti-Semitism. Noted anti-Semite Henry Ford wrote on May 22, 1920, if fans wish to know the trouble with American baseball, they have it in three words, too much Jew. A number of early Jewish ballplayers even changed their names so that it would not be apparent that they were Jewish. The movie discusses the key Jewish ballplayers in each decade since baseball started in the 1860s and how that helped Jews assimilate and counteract the stereotype of Jews as cerebral but not athletic. The film is in part about Jewish immigration and assimilation into American society, the passing on of Jewish traditions and heroism. Nobody knows exactly when or where baseball began, but by the middle of the 19th century, it was emerging as the most popular sport in America, played in sand lots in the country and empty lots in the city. America was made up of people from every other place on earth, and as each new group arrived, they too found baseball. At the end of the Civil War, the Jewish population in America was a quarter of a million, one half of 1% of the nation. One of the first players to receive money for playing baseball, $20 from the Philadelphia Athletics in 1866, was a Jew of Dutch origin, the outfielder Lippmann Emanuel Pike. When the first professional baseball league was organized in 1871, Lippmann Pike was its star. He led the league in home runs the first three years of its existence, hitting as many as six home runs in a season. In the first two decades of the 20th century, as immigrants made their often difficult adjustments to the new world, more and more Jews became ball players, professional ball players, than ever before. A few became standouts. Barney Pelty is the first Jewish player to appear on a baseball card. He was uh, a pitcher for the St. Louis Browns of the American League. Barney Pelty was known as the Yiddish Curver. Erskine Mayer was a pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies, 20 game winner. This is Erskine Mayer's 1914 Cracker Jack card. Anti-Semitism was on the rise in America with the mass increase in Jewish immigration. The Jew as a scapegoat for bad times remained some part of the fabric of America. It was not uncommon for Jews to change their names, to make them seem more suitable. Pitchers Phil Cooney of the Yankees, Harry Kane of the Tigers, and Edward Corey of the White Sox, infielder Sammy Bone of the Reds, and Reuben Ewing of the Cardinals were all born with the last name Cohen but chose new American names to stop the ethnic slurs that they faced when playing baseball. Andy Cohn is actually the first Cohn to use the name Cohn as a ball player. The Sporting News reported that the five foot eight Cohn had all the natural characteristics of his race, thick dark hair, dark skin, and keen mentality. Once Cohen, who sometimes heard slurs from the stands like Christ Killer, had run to catch a fly ball in short left field and made a good catch. A fan yelled out, just like the rest of the Jews, take everything they can get their hands on. It was a left-handed compliment, Cohen recalled, but that one didn't bother me. In October 1929, the stock market collapsed and America became mired in the Great Depression. Before the market crashed, Major League Baseball ticket revenues were $17 million. By 1933, gate receipts had plummeted to $11 million. But interest in baseball remained high in the nation, and it even increased dramatically among Jews for one major reason, the emergence of the first Jewish baseball superstar, the slugger Hank Greenberg. 
The six foot four Greenberg signed a contract with the Detroit Tigers and went off to play minor league baseball in 1930. Within three years, he was in the big leagues. Henry Greenberg with that mitt of his as big as a hot water bottle. In the eighth inning, Greenberg walloped that apple into the left field bleachers for a home run. Greenberg led the Detroit Tigers to the World Series in both 1934 and 1935. In 1935, he was named most valuable player in the American League. And he experiences anti-Semitism in all kinds of forms, people calling him all kinds of names in the dugout. I found that it was a spur to make me do better. Because I could never fall asleep on a ball field. You know, as soon as you struck out, you know, you were not only a, a, a bum, but you were a, a Jewish bum. We believed that because he was Jewish, they would never allow a Jew to break Babe Ruth's record. The fact is, he was the most prolific home run hitter in the game. So he got a lot of walks. He didn't think pitchers were not trying to pitch to him or that they didn't want him to break the record because he was a Jew. He just didn't hit one out. Hank Greenberg was not the only Jewish ball player in the major leagues during the 1930s. There were close to two dozen, and not the only star. Maury Arnovich, from an Orthodox Jewish family in Superior, Wisconsin, had two cousins become rabbis and kept kosher even while playing on the road. Subway Sam Nahum grew up in Brooklyn in an Arabic-speaking community of Syrian Jews. Nahum was a right-handed pitcher, but his political convictions were on the left. The catcher Mo Berg studied modern languages at Princeton and graduated with highest honors. It was said of Berg that he could speak seven languages, but couldn't hit in any of them. Albert Leonard Rosen was called up from the minor leagues to the Cleveland Indians in 1947 and again in 1948. Lou Boudreau, born of a French father and Jewish mother, was the team's manager and star shortstop. Hank Greenberg was then in charge of Cleveland's minor league teams. Rosen became the Indians' regular third baseman in 1950. He went on to lead the American League in home runs and was named Rookie of the Year. Al Rosen of the Indians parks a pitch by Vic Rashi of the New York Yankees in the left field stands. Al Rosen seemed to burst out of his uniform. He had a thick chest, he had incredibly muscular arms, and he had a violent swing. He always seemed to be damaging the ball when he hit it. In 1953, Rosen had a breakout year, leading the league in home runs with 43 and runs batted in with 145, and losing the race for the batting title by just one percentage point on the last day of the season. He was unanimously voted the league's most valuable player the first time that ever happened in Major League Baseball. Al Rosen retired in 1956 at age 32. In 10 big league seasons, he had been one of the premier sluggers in the game. He drove in 100 runs or more five years in a row, was regularly among the home run leaders, and was chosen for the all-star team four straight years. In the 1940s and early 50s, a number of other prominent Jewish players emerged. Goody Rosen, no relation to Al, was an outfielder from Toronto whose parents had immigrated to Canada from Minsk, Russia. Saul Raghavan, a pitcher with the White Sox who suffered from narcolepsy and sometimes fell asleep on the bench, was the American League's earned run average leader in 1951. Cal Abrams was an outfielder for eight seasons with five major league teams, including his hometown Dodgers. In 1951, Abrams was having one of his best seasons, and the Jews of Brooklyn honored him with Cal Abrams' night. But Dodger manager Chuck Dressen decided not to put Abrams in the lineup. Abrams was mortified at what he perceived as a slight. The all-star third baseman and outfielder, Sid Gordon, the son of a Russian immigrant coal dealer in Brooklyn, was generally considered the best Jewish player in the National League in the 1940s and 50s. Though some of Gordon's best years were with the hated rival New York Giants, his home borough Brooklyn fans nonetheless honored him with a Sid Gordon day at Ebbets Field. But no Jewish player captured the hearts of fans and the respect of his baseball colleagues more than the left-handed pitcher from Brooklyn, Sanford Sandy Koufax. 
Sandy Koufax in his prime was Pablo Picasso of pitching. He was the greatest artist there ever was. He had the easiest, smoothest motion. He was the smartest pitcher of his time. He knew exactly where to put the pitch so that the batter wouldn't hit that pitch. And you went to every game assuming he would pitch a no-hitter. You felt, how could anybody possibly get a hit off this guy? Sandy's control has been amazing with 25 strikes out of 28 pitches. Koufax pitched in the 1959 World Series against the White Sox and lost the fifth game one to nothing. The Dodgers went on to win the series four games to two. Their unlikely star was another Jewish pitcher for the Dodgers, the reliever Larry Sherry, who won two games and saved two games, the first time in history that one pitcher appeared in all four winning games. Larry Sherry has saved both Los Angeles victories. In 1960, Norm Sherry joined his brother on the Dodgers as a backup catcher and was Sandy Koufax's roommate on the road. Koufax pitched no-hit games in 1962 and 1963. I went out every day to pitch a perfect game. The first walk, you're going to pitch a no-hitter. The first hit, you're going to pitch a one-hitter. Uh, your goals are to be as good as you can be, and you give up your goals very grudgingly. And if you've given up nine hits, it's going to be a nine hitter. There's not going to be a tenth one. I just kept hearing this name, Koufax, Sandy Koufax, Sandy Koufax. Koufax backs out the first two. It was if the batters were little league hitters and he was a big league pitcher. Koufax starts off by Sandy Koufax. Richardson fans again. They could not hit Sandy Koufax. He so dominated the hitters, it was a beautiful, classic work of art as far as baseball is concerned. The Dodger lefty looks toward first and then slips a third strike past Mantle. A slow breaking curveball. Clearly, there was something remarkable going on. Eighth strikeout for Koufax. And I became mesmerizing. I listened to the rest of the game. And suddenly I had a team, the Dodgers. And I had a hero, and that was Sandy Koufax. Sandy, Andy, Sandy, shows the ball and it is in the catcher's mitt. They can't hit one of the day, can't see to them. Is a moral victory. Sandy. Game one of the 1965 World Series, the Los Angeles Dodgers versus the Minnesota Twins, fell on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish year. Koufax had been scheduled to pitch the opening game. I had taken Yom Kippur off for 10 years and Rosh Hashanah for 10 years before that. It's just something I'd always done as uh, respect. And he says, I'm going to, to choose to honor my religion. I'm going to choose not to play baseball on the most important day in my people's religious calendar. Anybody of my age group, if you ask them what was the seminal event, and they're honest, they'll tell you, Sandy Koufax not playing in the World Series on Yom Kippur. Don Drysdale, the number two man on the Dodgers starting rotation, pitched the opening game instead of Koufax. Drysdale pitches and Versailles gets around on this one. He pulls it down the line. He was hit hard, giving up seven runs in the first two and a third innings before the Dodgers manager decided to pull him from the games. Koufax was the starting pitcher three times in the series, leading the Dodgers to victory in seven games. Strikeout number 10, Koufax and the Dodgers take the World Series. The Twins never got a man to third base against the remarkable left-hander. When Sandy Koufax becomes the Jewish icon in America, he's really the reappearance of Hank Greenberg, but to a very different Judaism. Here's a Jew who made it as a baseball player, and made it big and made it good, and is an outstanding human being off the field as well as on the field. From 1961 to 1966, Koufax won 75% of his games. Twice he struck out 18 batters in a game, equaling Bob Feller's record. And in 1965, 
he set the major league record for strikeouts in a season with 382. The great Yankee manager Casey Stengel was once asked, who's the best left-handed pitcher you ever saw? Stengel replied, the Jewish kid. Comes to with us. Outfielder Art Shamsky, a Jew who grew up in St. Louis, was a standout contributor to the 1969 world champion New York Mets. Kenny Holtzman, also from St. Louis, became the premier Jewish pitcher of his generation, winning 174 games in his big league career, the most of any Jewish pitcher ever, including Sandy Koufax. Steve Stone, from suburban Euclid, Ohio, won 25 games for the Baltimore Orioles in 1980 and the Cy Young Award as the best pitcher in the American League. Some Jewish players publicly embraced their ethnic identity. Mike Epstein, from Los Angeles, was a muscular, slugging first baseman for several major league teams. His nickname was Super Jew, and when he hit the ball, he could hit it as far as anybody. comes Sean Green. The 1-0 pitch. A line drive, base hit in the center field. Sean Green is actually the premier Jewish ball player of the 1990s and the early part of the first decade of the 21st century. Wow. Among all the 17,000 players who ever played Major League Baseball, Sean Green had the single best nine-inning offensive performance in the history of the game. And this ball is out of here, a home run for Sean Green. By the first decade of the 21st century, Jews regularly made up 3% of major leaguers. In 1999 and then in 2008 and 2009, there were three Jews chosen for the All-Star game. Among the All-Stars was Boston's Kevin Euclid. Kevin Euclid is arguably the successor to Sean Green as the dominant Jewish player of this decade. In the center field, a base hit for Euclid. Red Sox will walk off with a win. Like millions of other American young men, Adam Greenberg of New Haven, Connecticut, and no relation to Hank Greenberg, dreamed of one day playing in the major leagues. In July of 2005, Greenberg called his family to tell them he had been promoted from the minor leagues to play for the big league Chicago Cubs. On July 9, 2005, in the ninth inning, Adam Greenberg was called to pinch hit against the Marlins' Valerio De Los Santos. Greenberg brought up from West Tennessee and is making his major league debut in this appearance. The first pitch was a 92-mile-an-hour fastball. Adam Greenberg suffered a concussion and vertigo following the one and only pitch to him in the major leagues. He tried to come back. The Cubs released him, and then he played in the minor leagues with the Kansas City, Los Angeles, and Cincinnati organizations, and with the Bridgeport Bluefish in the independent Atlantic League. There's no question I'm going to make it. It's just a matter of with who, but uh, it's going to happen. The Jewish people in general, they've always been just battered down, always. You don't have to be taught to never give up. Everyone is a part of this tribe, and you're just, you know, fighting to just keep going and, and striving for, the, for excellence and striving to be on top. Baseball is history. Baseball is statistics. Baseball is ethnic pride. Baseball is strategy. Baseball is drama. Baseball is time to think during the intermissions. Baseball is timeless. In some ways, it's a metaphor for life. And there are times when baseball is just baseball. It doesn't have any symbolic value. It's just a beautiful game. This film chronicles the story of a once marginalized people finding their way into the American mainstream. It also offers lessons for a country that continues to grapple with its ideal as a place where talent should overcome prejudice, where we can retain our differences while still being American, where anyone can be a part of the magic and drama of our national game. If you enjoyed this sample, please look for the full-length film at JewsInBaseball.com. That's our program for today, and I want you to know we appreciate hearing from you. 
please send your comments and questions to comments at pjtn.org. In fact, I have two I'd like to read for you now. The first one is from Margaret. She says, Dear Lori, God bless and keep you for all that you do in standing up for America and Israel. We have another one from Tina. She says, thank you so much for all you do. I am watching some of the early DVDs and I am very impressed by what your organization does. Thank you. The time to take a stand is now. Be a leader in your community and in your church. One person can make a difference. Get involved with and support pro-Israel organizations such as PJTN. Call your senators, congressmen, the White House. Let your elected leaders hear from you. Visit our website to learn more. Sign up to receive action alerts and order our films to share with family and friends. Please encourage everyone you know to tune in and become informed. God bless you and thank you for all you do on behalf of our Jewish brethren and all Israel. We'll see you next time on Focus on Israel. You just learned a portion of the truth about the world's most volatile region, the world's most demonized country, and the 2,000 year hatred of a people that have survived despite the odds. From studying history, it's very clear that what starts with the Jews never ends only with the Jews. We must strongly stand against any anti-Semitic trends, for if not stopped, they'll cause harm to all of us and we'll witness the downfall of our Judeo-Christian Western culture. Today, many people say there's no longer a need for a Jewish state, that Jews around the world no longer need a place of refuge. But anyone who has heard recent statistics about the worldwide rise in anti-Semitism would never make such a claim. The reality is that neo-Nazi groups and Nazi sympathizers are increasing around the world. Surveys show that over 1 billion people in the world harbor anti-Semitic attitudes. Close to 50% believe that Jews have too much power in the business world, and two-thirds of the world's population has never heard of the Holocaust, or believe the historic accounts of it are inaccurate. Don't let yourself be manipulated by evil people with a wicked agenda. When the self-serving villains are in control, Good people from all religions suffer. Muslims, Christians, and all people of conscience should stand proudly and show respect for a country that gives so much to the world in so many ways. Do your part, do your research, and do what you can to make a difference. Because what happens in Israel does affect us all. This is not just a Jewish or just an Israeli problem. This is a problem for all humanity for each and every one of us who believe in freedom and human rights. Learn more about what you can do at pjtn.org.